leads us to our uh, featured guest today, um, Richard Kidd. And Richard is Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Environment and Energy Resilience for Earth Week. And um, I just a little bit of background. Richard has served on the Board of Directors of Yale Blue Green since its inception uh, with me and Anne and um, I don't know, a few others. Um, you know, Becky and 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 Ann Crowley are on the board at, at this point. But at the beginning, when I first uh, met a number of the board members, at least virtually, and was introduced to Rich, I said, oh, this guy would be very interesting to talk to. And I've never really had the opportunity. And one of the major reasons that I've always felt that is that as his, his work with the uh, Department of Defense and working with the Army, I've always thought, well, I'm sure that there's programs having to do with sustainability and the environment and the Department of Defense, but I have not a clue what they are. And I don't, it, like, when you think of the Army or you think of the Department of Defense, you're thinking military for the most part. Um, so my curiosity is just uh, peaked and I have always wanted to ha have a chance to sit down with, with Rich. And, and this is the first time, really, and it's still virtual. <laughs> so I, I just would love him to, to start us off with, um, you know, how and why did the Department of Defense start getting involved in sustainability in the environment? And maybe you can give us first a little background and then we'll move into, you know, current state and what you're doing now and all of its various aspects. Great. Hey, well, Chip, thanks. Thanks for that kind introduction. Margo and Ann, uh, thanks for helping to set this up. I see a couple of friends on the call. Uh, so thanks. For some of you, Dave, Tony, Don, and others who joined, appreciate that. Um, yeah, so just you know, uh, you know, I, I graduated from the School of Management, so I like organizational design and structure. But recognizing that I'm in the most complex bureaucracy within the federal government, the Department of Defense, just so you understand. So I work in the office of the Secretary of Defense and set energy and environmental policy for the department. Then the services, Army, Navy, Air Force, actually get the money and and, uh, deli and, and execute those policies at, at a large scale. So um, that, that's kind of kind of where I am. And so just a little bit, you know, ships right when you think of the Department of Defense. Yeah, think ships and planes and missiles and all of that stuff. I mean, we have a mission which is to deter conflict, ensure our nation's security, uh, and uh, and to 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 be dependable and reliable to the country uh, anytime we're needed. To do that, the country gives us three precious resources, all right? They give us money, lots of it. That's a policy political discussion, whether it's the right amount or not, but they give us money. We're a voluntary military where young men and women choose to, to join. So they, the country puts the lives and the welfare of their young people in our hands. And then they give us this tremendous natural endowment. All right, so we have almost 27 million acres of land across the country that's been placed in our care. And in order to fulfill our mission of, of deterring conflict or resolving it favorably, we have to train, we have to be ready. And so we need this, this land and air and water resources to train our forces. And at the same time, we recognize that we have to preserve the quality of that land for future generations of military leaders. So in many ways, you know, when you talk about sustainability, you talk about generational equality, our military leaders today recognize they have to preserve the quality of the natural resources for the next generation, the next generation of military leaders. So uh, we are committed to protecting the planet and ensuring the safety and health of, of our people, uh, our, our uniformed service members, their families, and the communities around our installations. It's Protecting the environment is basically, it's good for the mission, and it's about maintaining trust with the American people, all right, and all of those three things that they give us. So I want to give you a sense of scale here, right, and there's some unique things about the Department of Defense that folks don't necessarily know. So 27 million acres, 
of uh, unique is ecosystems and habitat from the Arctics to the tropics, uh, you know, uh, water systems, reefs, uh, rainforests, temperate forests, grasslands, wide and diverse set of, uh, of natural uh, ecosystems and habitats. So the department is a steward of more than 500 threatened and endangered species, 55 of which only exist on, on DOD lands. We have more endangered species than any, uh, with a custodianship of more endangered species than any other federal agency. So yes, Fish and Wildlife looks after all endangered species, but they're not resident on fish and wildlife lands. So largest, if you will, custodian of endangered species in the, in the United States. And we've had some recent successes on that. So we downlisted five endangered species in one day in January. Uh, to sort of kick off the 50th anniversary of the Endangered Species Act. And we're on pace to do a number uh, throughout the year. So we've downlisted the most in one day and we're gonna downlist the most in one year by the end of, of 2023. In terms of cultural endowments, we, we have recorded more than 102,000 archeological sites, all right? These include everything from native uh, Native American uh, hieroglyphics and uh, rock carvings and sacred sites to pioneer cemeteries to uh, uh, barracks and forts out west, Civil War era uh, buildings and other facilities. So 132,000 archaeological sites. We have the largest inventory of historic properties in the country. So we have 49 individual historic landmarks. 15,000 assets that are determined to be eligible on the National Historic Registry, headed towards 50,000 assets in 2030 and 100,000 in 2035. That's not necessarily a good thing. And I can talk about that in terms of the maintenance costs because we cannot maintain all those properties in a historic uh, manner. So we have to, and I'm happy to take questions about that. So also we manage forests. And you know, proper forest management requires controlled burns. So as a percentage of the forestry under management, we have the highest percentage of any, uh, any entity in the country in terms of controlled burns. So we, we do controlled burns on about 650,000 acres a year. Our wildfires are about 350,000 acres. So our controlled burns are twice our wildfires, which is actually a good thing. Had our control burns been lower, our wildfires would arguably be, be higher. So um, Margo had asked me to say a few things about Native American affairs. So, you know, I like, I see the world through history, not poems. Sorry, uh, I, I have a hard time rhyming anything. But in terms of history, the, pre the precursor to the Department of Defense was, of course, the Department of War. And the Department of War was a signatory or a guarantor of the treaties made with Native Americans. So we have a special, what's called a trust responsibility enshrined in law. So in addition to all my other titles, I am a trustee of the treaties with Native Americans, which means I am duty and honor bound to uh, 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 recognize and enforce the rights which are contained in those treaties, whether they're uh, reserve rights, rights for uh, 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 traditional practices, rights for access for hunting, subsistence, subsistence hunting and harvesting. So um, there are 574 recognized federal tribes that are affiliated in some way with 236 of our installations. We have a whole body of laws that come down from Congress, plus those treaties, which have the effect of law that enshrine this sovereign uh, nation to nation relationship that are captured in a very large document that involves a range of activities and things that we have to, to do, whether it's consultation, recognition, uh, um, training, uh, cultural awareness, et cetera. And, um, and I would just say that under this administration, we have basically relooked and have rewritten or are rewriting the entire portfolio of our directives and documents and memorandums around uh, and how we interact with, with Native Americans. One of the most recognized things that we, we do with, with, with Native Americans is we have, a, we have a program actually run out of this office. So normally the office and Department of Defense doesn't run programs. So what's quite interesting is we actually have about $1.2 billion of programs that we actually run. 
an innovation team, uh, an energy resilience team, and a couple of other activities on climate change. And then uh, NALUMP, which is the Native Americans Land Environmental Mitigation Program. So during particularly World War II, when our country fully mobilized, we made training centers all across the nation. And a lot of those training sites were on Native American lands, either on reservations or that were sort of traditional lands that they used uh, for uh, uh, practices, hunting, gathering, or religious rites. So we have uh, a special program where we go enter into cooperative agreements with Native American tribes, <clears throat> and we clean up any residue that may uh, have existed from previous training activities. So we work, we've worked on about 100 sites for $179 million. Most of that work is in the Southwest uh, and Upper Midwest, as well as in Alaska. So uh, the point there is to protect and prioritize health and human safety, but also restore and protecting the natural and cultural resources and return those tribes to the land, to the Native American tribes for their optimal use. So, um, I'm missing one page here. This is easily solved because I have a computer and I can mm -hmm. go to my outline right over here. Okay, so other activities that we we do in terms of uh, the uh, the environment, we also do cleanup activities for contaminants or past action, whether it's a known carcinogens or chemicals of concern, such as PFAS, which is in the press. Happy to talk about that if folks have questions. We have uh, our office manages our environmental liabilities for the Department of Defense. So we have we have to report liabilities to Congress. Our largest is health care. The second largest is environment and nuclear cleanup. Of that, of that amount, uh, approximately $40 billion has been set aside, is the estimate for future current and future cleanup costs. So we are about, we've cleaned up about 88% of all the known sites of either some form of contamination, whether it's unexploded ordnance or chemicals, but that remaining 12% in many cases are the largest and hardest sites, and thus that, that pretty significant cleanup bill. Switching gears, Maybe I'll stop there. Any questions on the environment that I was going to switch to energy and climate? I can stop right right now if, if you guys have any questions to date on the environment or, or we can keep going. Richard, I, I actually have a question. Um, yeah. I have a, I have an a, a artist client who um, makes artwork out of uh, trash, you know, garbage. And she sure. was inspired to do this because she served in Iraq uh and she saw the mountains of garbage that you know the that the, the forces were creating there um and i'm sure that there were certain contingencies related to you know getting rid of trash in iraq but um i should imagine you know given the you know the 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 just the usage of of people of armies of navies um, that the armed forces create an incredible amount of trash. Uh, can you address the situation in terms of, you know, the garbage in, garbage out? How, how much is being done in terms of just, you know, lessening the problem when I should imagine there's a whole lot of bureaucracy about yeah. what kind of bottles are even used and all that. Um, and then sort of on the other end, uh, what is just being done in terms of uh, the, the incredible waste makers that uh, the Def Department of Defense is? Yeah. So, hey, you know, Stephanie, so you're you're right. I mean, so first of all, you've got to, you raise a very good question. And earlier today, I was with a meeting with EPA and we were discussing the national recycling strategy. So at one level, the department has a very, very good if I would say generation one recycling strategy. So in peacetime on our installations, we do a, a, a better than average job by that and compared to sort of municipalities across America, we recycle more wood, more plastic, more paper, more tin, you know, more of that than your average American community is the norm for the department. Uh, but, but I say first gen because you know, we really need to move to an approach with circularity, where, where we're designing in 
you know, multiple uses for a product where the, you, you use it, you manufacture it, you use it, you know, you, 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 you downcycle it, you recycle it, you reuse it. So I really like to switch the department over to that mentality. And that's a hard lift. Uh, but I think it's, I think it's very important. Now, you know, what your clients, what she observed in Iraq and elsewhere, there's a couple of functions that contribute to that. One is the host nation capacity for waste management. So, you know, I was a relief worker for the UN in the 90s, and I went all over the world. And a lot of my pictures from the time were just piles and piles of garbage, right, wherever you went. Uh, and that's because of uh, local capacity. And, you know, also oftentimes, you, you know, the the, the recycling program in many of these places was trash pickers, where they would go through the garbage and recycle everything from food to uh, metal and plastics. So, uh, you know, I'm not endorsing that. I'm just saying that was the norm, and it is the norm uh, in many places. So we can't bring in with us, uh, you know, a municipal waste recycling program. Um, likewise, a lot of our consumption patterns are... Um, dictated by one-way logistics, right? Well, how do you get it in? I'm not, I'm not, I'm explaining, I'm not apologizing, right? I'm just, you know, as well as a security environment. So in a lot of places, any truck that comes into a military base has to be inspected and make sure there's no bombs, no smuggling, et cetera. Same with a truck that goes out. So, um, so sometimes the waste haulage out is a, is a problem. A security issue. Um, and a lot of times the items that we use, they're, they're designed for longevity or reliability, not recyclability. And, you know, the great example is this meal ready to eat package. If you've ever seen one of these, it's a meal in a, in a big plastic pouch, but it's a plastic pouch that, you, you know, will last forever. Uh, it's, it's really durable and it's designed to protect the food for the soldiers. But then what do you do with that pouch? And um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of things out there. We have we have on our team, we have what's called the STED Sustainable Technology Evaluation and Demonstration Program. Uh, and we also have a bio-based products program. I would say that they are interesting, but we don't have enough uptake. We have some real successes. Uh, you know, soldiers use a cleaning solvent on their weapons. It's a hydrocarbon-based cleaning solvent. It uh it uh, creates a lot of smoke. It gets on their clothes. It has residue. It's it's kind of nasty, uh, but it gets the weapons clean. We've come up with a bio-based alternative. Doesn't smoke, degrades, no hazardous residue, works better on the weapons, so soldiers like it. So we've been able to create a bio-based alternative that uh, is preferred. Um, but to your point, you, you know, we need to do a lot more in a lot uh, in a lot of different areas. One last thing on come, you know, trash and war zones. Um, you've probably heard of burn pits, uh, which the president mentioned in his remarks. So our team is work. You know, we're, we're America. We throw we throw technology at the problem, and sometimes with success. So what we've created both a containerized burn pit, and what's a little more interesting is a waste to energy. So uh, in the first version, you burn the waste, and it. It goes through a filter system and traps, uh, reduces any harmful gases. And the second, you actually turn, burn the waste and turn it into energy, which then gets fed into the tactical microgrid and used to power soldier facilities. So oh, you, it's a long been, answer. So if you've been able to, I mean, it's interesting that you're talking about some of these, you know, bio products and everything. Have you, have you been able to develop something that then can be now used by the general public? I mean, can... I mean, can the, you know, given the massive problems of some of these things, can the armed forces, can the Department of Defense actually come up with some innovations that could then be uh, used more generally? And has, it, has this happened in some instances? Yeah, so, so, so the answer is yes, yes, if. Okay, yes, if, right? So there's a, there is a long history of technology transfer from the Department of Defense to the private sector and vice versa. But the technology, so the Department of Defense does not use innovation to solve problems for America, all right? That's the Department of Energy's challenge or, uh, uh, or uh, other agencies in the federal government and universities. We use innovation to solve problems for the Department of Defense, which may then have a corollary benefit for America or 
uh, or, or we sort of partner with industry for mutually beneficial technology. So for example, when we talk about energy, uh, we spend, our office manages about $650 million of military construction money for, for cyber secure microgrids. So we are one third of the microgrid construction market in America, and we are one third of the large uh, 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 utility scale battery storage market in America. We are driving that market and we're doing it because it provides advantages for our installations. All right. But I've gotten, you know, every year somebody comes into my office and says, look, if you just bought the first million of my widgets, it would change the market. And I say, well, what does your widget do for the Department of Defense? And they say, well, if you just bought a million of my widgets, it would change the market. OK, <laughs> so we have this circular discussion. Uh, a, a couple of things we're, invest we're, we're investing in that will change America. We're investing with the Department of Energy in super Super duper, can I say super duper? Super duper lightweight solar film that is about the size of, a, is about the thickness of a piece of paper and you can put it on any surface and it's more efficient than some of our flat panel solar right now. It's extremely expensive, right? But, uh, but it, sometimes if it gives us an advantage, we can be the first mover and drive the cost down. So the example in this case is we put it on the wings of unmanned aerial vehicles, they fly, they collect power. They base, in this case, they produce hydrogen uh, uh, during the day, and then at night they run a, a motor off of the a fuel cell motor off of the hydrogen, and they stay up day and night, day and night. So those solar uh, that that thin film solar, you know, it's not in a store near you now, but because of our investment, we're driving the cost down, and it'll be a lot more attractive to others. And that whole storyline, by the way, everything I just told you, I learned from Ann Crawley when we work together at the Department of Energy, all right? So, so, uh, so I'm gonna say one thing that the, I didn't know about the solar film, but um, before I worked at Department of Energy, I worked for the Air Force and um, I mean, you can thank the Department of Defense for transistors and lasers and there's all kinds of stuff that comes out of it. That was a long time ago, but. Great. So hey, why don't, speaking of energy, why don't I press on just a little bit yeah, and talk, talk about our talk about our energy. So we categorize our energy sort of in two ways, installation energy, which is analogous to whatever, like a university or a small town. So we have, you know, we have 500 small towns around America called military installations that are, you know, have an energy demand from like two or three megawatts to 90 megawatts. And, um, and, uh, and that's sort of electricity and gas that we use in non-tactical vehicles. Um, we have a requirement to make a lot of that energy on our installations resilient. So we're adding microgrids and on-site power generation. Some of that is PV uh, and some of it right now, frankly, is still natural gas and diesel. But well, we've got a big, uh, some big investments planned for next gen geothermal, as well as advanced nuclear and some perhaps on hydrogen. So those are carbon free, Base load power sources that we'll put on our, our on our installation. So uh, we're going to release our greenhouse gas mitigation report. So the first time ever the department has re released a report on mitigation. Uh, it'll be out in a couple of weeks as soon as I can get it cleared from legisl legislative affairs. The good news is on the installation side, we are very confident that we can get to net zero on or about the pace that science sets. Right. So the president has said 2035. I think we'll probably get be there or close to that. We have technology, we have the tools, we have a clear pathway to get there. Um, that's about one third of our energy consumption. The other two thirds is essentially liquid fuel. It's jet fuel. We only burn one type of fuel, same fuel in a truck as in a jet, uh, you know, as in a tank. And, uh, and that's our operational energy. So that's energy that goes into an F-35 or an M1 tank. So together, those two energy consumption is about 1% of the, of the nation's energy uh, uh, consumption, and likewise about 1% of, of the nation's greenhouse gases. So if, if the Department of Defense were a country, you know, we emit more greenhouse gases than about 55 countries in the United Nations. You know, so Switzerland and uh, Luxembourg and Czech Republic, all those, all those nations are below the Department of Defense in greenhouse gas emissions and energy consumption. 
On the operational energy side, you know, we have a lot of a lot of technology, a lot of money, and a lot of expectation that we can reduce uh, the the energy. Uh, we call that demand reduction. So little things like adding winglets and changing uh, the orientation of a um, of a windshield wiper on a C-17 transport plane can save 1% of the fuel, but that 1% plus another 1% plus another, that can actually add up. We've also, uh, you know, in terms of changing the markets, we're gonna making a big play in what's called blended wing body. So if you've ever, that your current aircraft is a tube and a stick, uh, the blended wing body is more like a shaped Frisbee and it has lift for the whole aircraft. And that saves about 40 to, plus percent of the fuel. So we're going to be the early adopter of that aircraft design. But even with all of this, we don't have a clear pathway for operational energy to get to net zero, right? There's not a set of technologies right now that will uh, replicate the, the benefits of a, of, a, of a liquid fuel. And sustainable aviation certainly has some promise. It's very complex. I can talk about it. The bottom line is, uh, it's distributed, not centralized production. You have to work through 10 different feedstocks. Uh, it's going to be very expensive, and the private airliners are going to buy every gallon made. Uh, so, so we're going to, you know, we can't compete with them. But anyway, um, so that suggests either more investments in technology or a need for us to be part of the, the sequestration budget for the country. So if you look to the future, you know, uh, there's gonna need to be a sequestration requirement for the country to offset uh, greenhouse gas emissions that cannot be abated otherwise. Anyway, so um, on the installation energy side, talked about microgrids, geothermal, nuclear, uh, you know, uh, non-tactical vehicle fleet, you know, we've made some significant improvements just through better management. We've reduced our petroleum consumption by 41% just by more efficient vehicles, change in culture, change in management. Um, also paying a lot of attention to our built environment. So the buildings, so we have about 500 structures, uh, depending on how you count a structure. So we've got some sheds with, a, with an outlet in it that I guess is technically a structure. But anyway, uh, so a lot of investment in terms of making those buildings uh, more uh, energy efficient, more sustainable. Uh, we actually, I should have, in my fun facts, we have the highest, uh, the largest inventory of LEED certified buildings in the nation at all categories except for platinum, all right? But we do have the, the nation's only LEED platinum hospital. So we, we can build a highly efficient uh, building and uh, we need to do more of that and look towards buildings that have a variety of functions and uses over their lifetime. So a lot of times we build special purpose one-off buildings and we need to be a little more flexible in that. But happy to talk about sustainable uh, buildings. Finally, uh, just get a little bit on, uh, on, on climate. So, you know, climate is the context. Everything we do is going to be affected by climate. Climate is affecting the Department of Defense now by increasing our operational demands, whether it's to provide you know, stability or humanitarian response around the world or National Guardsmen uh, responding to forest fires at home. It's degrading our infrastructure uh, and our installations. And then it's creating health hazards for our, for our service members in terms of heat. So 36 degrees Celsius, wet bulb, you can't cool your body, you can't be a soldier, sailor, or airman, you will die. So, uh, so we have to recognize the, the growing threat of heat injuries and, and other items on our force. And we're experiencing that today. <clears throat> we have a climate adaptation plan, which was recognized, got a couple of awards for, um, for uh, sort of the thought process that went into the, the climate adaptation plan. We have a tool behind it called the Defense Climate Assessment Tool. We've basically taken every installation in, in, the, in the inventory. We've got a few left but essentially all. We've looked at two epochs, two time periods, two greenhouse gas uh, uh, scenarios. We've looked at the effects of our installations from sea level rise, riverine flooding, heat, drought, uh, fire, uh, energy demand, uh, and uh, extreme weather. And now we're able to build a model and we're using that information as we make investment decisions and master planning and as we look at sort of our construct, building construction techniques, and tomorrow for Earth Day, we're going to 
give that away to six of our allied partners. You know, mm. if you, it, it's going to be featured on the White House press page. So, you know, if you're curious tomorrow about this time, there might be a little blurb. But the idea is to is to help uh, help us prepare for the inevitable adaptation. So when we talk about adaptation, that's uh, that's managing the unavoidable. Uh, we talk about mitigation. That's trying to avoid the unmanageable. And we bring the two together and we think of climate resilience. So um, uh, we also have a large uh, research and development program. As I said, $440 million in clean tech, environmental tech, and other items that come out of this office, trying to solve energy problems, environmental problems. And you know, to Stephanie's point, I, I mean, um, we have the largest research program in the nation on detecting and cleaning up PFAS. You may have heard of the so-called forever, forever chemical. So all the technological advances that were they're starting to come to the market essentially had their roots in Department of Defense funding as we were trying to figure out ways to clean that material up. Anyway, so I just want to leave you guys. Look, Department of Defense, we have these huge natural endowments. We recognize they are important to our mission, but they're you know, provided to us by the country, and we have to honor that trust to those endowments, and we have to preserve them, you know, for future military operations and, you know, for future generations. And we also recognize that these natural endowments perform ecosystem services and that extend well off our installations. In that regard, we have a partnership with, um, called, uh, that we work with, um, conservation NGOs and local authorities to hold land in, in conserve, conservation easements. So we've, we've got about a million acres, a little more than a million acres now in conservation easements around our installations. Those kind of help preserve our training, but also ensure that an ecosystem in its entirety is protected. Mm -hmm. So with that, you know, it's a great job. Uh, it's governed by lots of rules and politics and bureauc bureaucratic uh, activities here in Washington. But overall, it's a, it's a terrific job and best one I've had after 30 some years of public service. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm happy mm -hmm. to take any questions, any additional questions. Yeah, I wanted, if I could, um, wanted to bring up a, a, a couple of uh, sort of higher level questions. You know, that in the political and social environment, there are certainly a lot of people in and out of Congress and whatever that are saying, oh, climate you know, changes, it's all fake and it's not real. And so I'm wondering what kind of support and pushback you get both uh, within the military and with uh, people in Congress who are saying, oh, this doesn't exist, we shouldn't be doing anything. And marrying with all, marrying that with all of the programs that you have going on to try to mitigate against what seems like the inevitable changes that are happening. Yeah, so... So yeah, Chip, you're right. I mean, it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate that physics has become politicized. All right. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. physics isn't political. Physics is physics. Um, so in that, in those discussions, two things. One, I actually rely a lot on the Yale um, uh, climate change communication study uh, team. I, I didn't get that exact name right, but I got their web page bookmark, so I don't have to know the name. I just go to the <laughs> bookmark. But uh, you guys, I think you guys all know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, and um, and uh, also, you know, we position the military based on our mission, right? So we are not here to fight climate change. We are here to be resilient. All right. We're resilient against all hazards and a clear-eyed objective threat-based, risk-based, and that's what we do. Like we, we look at risks, we look at threats. We do that every day in every context, right? And it says, look, you ha we have to be prepared. We have to adapt to a changing climate and we have to mitigate our greenhouse gas emissions in part to keep trust with the American people. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, over here on my desk someplace, I got a signed copy of, of a book from Senator Inhofe. Yeah, so we had a shouting match a few years ago. Not a shouting match, he shouted at me. I just listened. But um, but anyway, yeah, we do have those political engagements. But for the department, we continue to just position that you know this is clear-eyed view of the physical reality. And for those of you who asked, yes, the climate adaptation plan is available to the public. It's online. I might try to see if I can multitask and find it for you and put it in the chat. Well, Lauren just put it up there. It's on the chat. Oh, Wendy. no, she put up the climate communication. 
because uh, that was the name I was struggling with. But okay. uh, that's a great resource, by the way, if you haven't gone there. Richard, um, this is Wendy. I just wanted to commend you the study that you've done across all of the different bases and looking at you know different scenarios with different levels of greenhouse gases and how you adapt. Is that something that by region could be used by um, municipal governments to begin to help people understand how to protect and make resilient their own communities? Yeah, so the technology is certainly transferable and we are, we are working to expand it to the communities that are, um, that are adjacent to our military installations and uh, you know the White House for the um, Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure has a climate screening tool. So their climate screening tool, the code is about 50% of that code is ours. That came from our, our program and sort of the concepts. So they layer in, they, they use some of our data layers and analysis and they layer in additional ones. So the idea is that for all the money that's coming out from the federal government, they, that those infrastructure projects have to be checked against various climate scenarios over time to make sure you're not making a bad investment. So, uh, so that's one one way our technology has sort of gotten out to the to the to the rest of the world. Uh -huh. Thank you. Uh, um, I think uh, uh, Andrea had um, a question. I saw her hand up. Hi, no, sorry. I was just one of the people who asked about the climate adaptation plan. So that was okay. mostly it, but I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, so I've, I, yeah, I got a problem with my browser here in the Pentagon because it doesn't allow me to copy links. It allows a, an extension. So, but anyway, if you just type in Department of Defense climate adaptation plan, you, you get it right away. That's great. Thank so, you so much. So I'm imagining that that you're dealing with a lot of the water level changes that are uh, planned to occur, you know, with ports and uh, you know the, your seaports all over the place. You know, um, maybe you can just explain something like that. How you you what are you doing with these huge naval installations, um, as an example? Yeah. So. Um... So that's a hard question, and there's some some politics in that as well, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But there's a variety of adaptation planning underway. So the a, a couple of things. The first sort of and sort of they go in gradients, right? So the first sort of action is to invest in, in natural solutions. So we have major programs on seagrass restoration or salt marsh restoration and mangrove. And barrier island restoration. So we are investing in that because that's sort of the first barrier uh, to, st to storm surge. Um, we're also then looking at sort of a combination of, uh, of gray and green infrastructure, nature-based solutions, artificial reefs, artificial uh, shorelines mm -hmm. that are more dependable and, 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 and sturdy. You know, then the next thing is, is of course, the seawall. Uh, there's not enough money to build a seawall around every naval installation. So then what do we do? And likewise, we don't want to be building using current generation concrete at that scale. You know, th th there's a huge emissions factor there. Right. Um, and then there's discussions about whether the nature of a Navy base needs to change. Maybe it needs to float or portions mm -hmm. of it need to float. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. So there's a lot of hard questions here. Or maybe some of the bases just aren't worth defending. But there are 50-year climate plans now for the Naval Academy, for Norfolk, working on one for Mayport. So uh, there, there's a couple of them out there. But it's it's definitely a, a hard. <laughs> I think, frankly, the department and the country has not come to grasp the the likely adaptation requirements that we're going to have to to do the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And the reality is, we cannot afford to protect everything. And so what we protect and what we don't protect, whether it's the department or as a nation, is a political decision. Mm. Well, that's really fascinating, fascinating stuff. Um, In a depressing sort of way, yes. Yeah, very much so. Uh, other questions that people might have? No? 
So I, had, wonder I, about, I, had, I wonder about the flip side of your, your question, Chip, uh, in terms of the politics and sort of not getting the funding. Because the Department of Defense budget is so huge, mm -hmm. are, are certain things getting funded that need funding because of sustainability and climate change that might not be if it were going, through, you know, this is, we need it for, you know, Maryland. Uh, you wouldn't get it for Maryland, but you'd get it for, say, the naval base in Maryland, if there is a naval base in Maryland. I mean, is there a flip side to Chip's question? Is that for me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, so the nation has to be prepared to really make these hard decisions, right? So, uh, yeah, the bottom line is there's not enough public resources to adapt to all the requirements of climate change. So then how... How do we make those the you, you know how do you allocate resources in a in, when the demand exceeds the available? And you know, frankly, cutting a hundred billion dollars out of the Department of Defense isn't going to spare us those hard decisions. Mm. I had a another question about climate justice, and uh, you know, because it's it's very important to the whole climate effort in in a lot of different areas, and and. Where does that play into your strategic thinking and implementing or implementing all of these various programs? Yeah, no, great question. So uh, I've got a lot of additional titles, but I'm I'm uh, I'm the EJ officer for the department. I, I'm going to the White House on Friday, but they won't tell me what it's for. Although I think the president's going to sign a new executive order, so if I'm lucky, I'll get to be in the room uh, with Joe when he signs this executive order. We'll see. It, it, and oh. it's on the issues of environmental justice and environmental equity. So, you know, what's interesting for our military installations, um, the Biden administration has a goal of 40% of the grant money that for those agencies that give grants or get uh, money in the bipartisan infrastructure law or the Inflation Reduction Act, about 40% of that money has to go to designated sort of environmental justice uh, communities or EJ affected communities. So we've taken a we, we've geo referenced our military installations with the uh, EJ map, and roughly 39% of our installations, so close to 40, uh, abate or uh, abut uh, uh, EJ affected communities. So in many cases, we're the largest employer or the largest provider of goods and services to those to those communities. And as we go about our planning. We have to be mindful of equity issues inside and outside the installation. We can't build resilience on our installation at the expense of the outside community, for example. Um, wow, that's great. And then, and then there's there's issues with environmental cleanup and some of those communities as well, which is, of course is a, is a factor in, in some of our planning. I think Becky had her hand up first. Yes, thank you, thank you. I, I had a question, and I don't know if there's anything you could actually share. You look in this, like you're in the witness protection program, by the way. Yeah, I know, I know. I, I, I should be doing it this way or something so I can see my face. Um, there you go. So you'd mentioned sort of um, some of the upstream projects you're working on, like the really paper thin, um, you know, solar for the planes. Is there anything else you can share that you has the potential to really revolutionize uh, and become so mainstream that it could be affordable to be? you know, produced, you know, outside of the Department of Defense and, and like next generation geothermal or something, or is there anything that you are working on that yeah. you think has the potential to, you know, game change uh, the rest yeah. of the country? Yeah, so first of all, I, I mean, yeah, for next, next gen geothermal, I'm a big fan. So basically, and this is, got to give credit to the, pet, the hydrocarbon industry here. So when you frack for natural gas, you produce stuff. You produce natural gas, you produce byproducts, you produce, you know, dirty water, but you also produce data. So you take all of that data from across all of those fracking wells, you, you, the, and you can then use that to find heat that we currently didn't know existed, or it's not, that we that we used to, that we can now find that we didn't know existed previously. And then you use basically the same technology, a horizontal fracking technology. You put in a closed loop on a small pad that during, during the drilling looks just like an oil rig. Afterwards, it's a small shed. And you basically create a closed loop uh, a system at these small pockets of heat 
Uh, and so we have an RFP out for two of those. So it's the first RFP in the nation for working demonstration of next-gen geothermal. And the idea is these pads, each pad, depending on where you are, produces 10 to 15, maybe 20 megawatts of power, which isn't a large base load for like transmission, but it's certainly good for an installation or a community or a campus or a college. So we're, we're optimistic about that. We've got a range of other technologies, a lot of work in terms of heavy trucks that we're working with Detroit uh, with to sort of improve the hybridization and lower friction of trucks. That's not a, that exciting. One of the things that is potential excitement is power beaming. So able to convert electricity to a wavelength form where it, it can cover a long distance. And then you have an antenna at the other end that's attuned to that wavelength. So it's like a laser, but it's at the other end, rather than a target, there's a catcher's mitt and it converts the laser back into power. Wow. Well, we are almost at the top of the hour. I think we have probably time for, for one more. Um, I think E. Hogan 002 had. Yeah, sorry. My name's Ethan. Uh, I, I, I'm a work computer. And of course, your username for work pops up as when you're joining. So sorry about that. Um, but I was just really curious. Uh, my background is in utilities um, for my current job. And I worked a lot with power purchase agreements with customers. So I was curious about what the Department of Defense um, what their relationship is with especially CONUS um, uh, installations and utility companies. You know, I'm sure you have some that are connected to a larger network of companies and not all of them are microgrid. And uh, do you guys, how do you guys push a utility company possibly to go more green so that an installation, because I, I worked at a stock-based uh, uh, my company was on the stock market. And if you were to say, well, we're going to microgrid if you don't go green, we'd go green really quick. So just curious what your relationship is with uh, utility companies. Yeah, so three points. So one, we have a 30-year power purchase agreement authority. We're the only federal agency that does that. That is a great asset for us. And we've got a couple, uh, you know, over a gigawatt or so of, of renewable energy projects now that have been, that have gone through the power purchase agreement process. That's what we're going to do with the geothermal plants, the nuclear plants. We'll give them land, we'll give them a siting, and then we'll give them a 30 year offtake agreement, which they can then finance, use to finance the project. That's the, the first question. We also, working with GSA, uh, are, are the one of the, the us and GSA are the first federal agency just to go to market with a with a um, request for 24/7 carbon free electricity provided by our utilities. So we are one of the largest electric power consumers in the country. I think you know us, Walmart, and Google for their data centers. We all sort of compete for number one. So we're using that purchasing power for the utilities to start to drive carbon free electricity onto the grid or to their offerings. And then third, even though we have a microgrid that doesn't mean we are disconnected from the grid, right? The microgrid is there in case the grid goes down, but a microgrid at installation, we're trying to design these in a way that they can actually provide grid services. So they can be a, a virtual power plant, they can be a black start asset, they can be a variety of things back to the, the utility. If the grid goes down, then our microgrid turns on and meets the needs of the base. We've demonstrated the ability to do that at a couple of different locations. Well, we are out of time, which is most unfortunate because I think this is this is a program uh, that we actually need a big dinner and you know some wine and beer and a real conversation because Rich, this was great. I want to thank you so much. I learned a tremendous amount, and I would love to do a deeper dive into a lot of these things. I'm sure I'll, it'll lead me to to um, you know do some some research on some of this stuff. Great. Well, thanks, everyone. Uh